Bernard, the so-called anthropic principle has been a source of uh, interest and controversy uh, in the physics cosmology community and has been expropriated by many people outside of it, philosophers, even people with theological dispositions, uh, in ways that are perhaps um, uh, not, uh, not consistent with the original objective. Uh, you were there almost from the beginning when the anthropic principle was sort of coined by Brandon Carter. Uh, give, give me the history of, of, of the anthropic principle and in particular explain how it works, how it should work, and how it needs to work. Well, first of all, one has to make a clear distinction between what, what is called the weak anthropic principle and the strong anthropic principle. Now, the weak anthropic principle merely says that given the the laws of physics and the values of the physical constants, there is a selection effect on when and where observers must exist, which just comes from pure logic. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, we know we have to exist close to, we have to live close to a, a star, we know we have to live at a special time in the history of the universe. And so that's an example of the weak anthropic principle which I would say is, is really completely uncontroversial. It's just it's a, right. a logical necessity. Now, much more controversial was the strong anthropic principle, which as Carter defined it, was the fact that there are relationships between the physical constants themselves which, which are required for us to be here, or at least for some sort of observer to be present. Mm -hmm. and. What Carter did, and myself and Martin Rees did in our later paper, <coughs> we collected together all the large number of these unexplained coincidences between the constants of nature, which weren't explained by conventional physics, but seemed to be necessary for, for the existence of observers. Mm. Now, the way that he defined the strong anthropic principle, and the way that myself and Martin Rees defined it was simply in those terms, the values of the constants are required. It's a, the strong anthropic principle is a constraint on the constants of physics such that observers can be present. Mm -hmm. Later on, the term was used in a different way in the, in the famous Barrow and Tipler book in 1986. It was defined more in terms of the condition that, that, that the universe must be such that life can a, a different concept of must. So a different concept of must. It introduced a sort of teleological aspect, and I think that's what caused some confusion in the literature, because after that, people again started using the, the term in, in different ways. Mm. So there is, uh, I would say, quite a lot of ambiguity in, in what one means by the term the strong anthropic principle. And I, I think that's a pity. I think it would have been more straightforward if, if it had only been used in the sense that Carter had originally used the term. Mm -hmm. the, the term anthropic itself, though, was, which means anthropos, the Greek word for man, was, I think, also very unfortunate because it's really nothing to do with the presence of human beings in particular. It's, it's maybe to do with the existence of life or the existence of complexity, but I don't think it's anything to do with individual people, mm. I mean, mm. you know, humans in particular. So on both sides of that question, how uh, has the anthropic principle been used uh, properly within physics and cosmology, and how do you believe it was, has been used uh, inappropriately outside of it? Well, this really goes back to the question of what is your interpretation of, of, the, of these anthropic fine-tunings. If you believe that the anthropic, you see that there's essentially three types of interpretation of the anthropic principle. One interpretation is, is the multiverse interpretation, which simply says that there are lots and lots of universes with different values of the constants, and we just happen to be in the one which, one of the ones which allows life to arise. But there are more philosophical interpretations. And the second interpretation, for example, is the one that was, that comes out of quantum mechanics, the idea that maybe consciousness collapses the wave function of the universe. <clears throat> and I think it was Wheeler who first suggested, well, maybe 
you have the Big Bang and the universe evolves into consciousness, into brains which then reflect back on the Big Bang and you sort of get a closed <laughs> circuit and the universe comes into existence. And the idea was that in some sense, the consciousness itself was bringing the universe into existence. Well, most physicists also regarded that as, as, as far too metaphysical. <laughs> It's based on the idea of consciousness collapses the wave function, which is itself controversial. But the third explanation, of course, is, goes even beyond that and says, well, the reason the universe is fine-tuned is because there is a fine-tuner, <laughs> which some people might want to call God. And so you have this idea that maybe there is like a parameter, there's a parameter space where all the <clears throat> physical constants exist. And in some sense, God had to use a pin to choose yeah. the values which would allow <clears throat> life to eventually ar arise. Mm. Now, obviously, that's a theological explanation, and physicists were very <clears throat> unhappy with that. But depending on which explanation you favor, of course, it tends to depend on which of the interpretations of the strong anthropic principle you have. And those people who want to adopt a theological interpretation of the fine tunings, they obviously tend to have in mind a version of the strong anthropic principle which is more teleological in, in nature. Whereas the people who want to interpret the <coughs> fine tunings in terms of the multiverse, they don't have to have any teleology at all and they just have to have the concept there is this space of other universes. <laughs>